What's up guys, you're watching Life ATCG. Uh, just uploaded a Pioneer video, so if you're interested in that, you should check that out. I mentioned that, uh, that not this weekend right now, but one week from today, there's the GP in um, Nagoya, so that's a combined GP slash Pro Tour. Uh, the GP and the Pro Tour format are Pioneer, so I did say that I could be playing my Pioneer list at that event, or the other option is that I just play like Legacy side events the whole time, because um, I'm feeling way more confident about Legacy right now. Pioneer is still super new to me, um, and I feel like I'm still learning too much um, from all my games to feel um, really confident in it yet. So um, if I uh, do go to that, well, I am going to that. Uh, event, there'll be a pretty uh, significant chance that I just skip the Pioneer um, and play Legacy the whole time. So I'm going to go over my Legacy list that I've been working on. Um, I've been had this idea for quite a while for this list, um, but the the even though I got it to a stage where I'm like I was reasonably happy with it, um, the recent cards from the new Theros set have really um, given it a pretty solid boost. So uh, we'll get into that the list now. So as you can see, one Tundra, so um, it's some kind of blue-white deck. We have one, the one Tundra, five planes and five islands, um, then four Prismatic Vista, four Flooded Strand, and one additional blue fetch land. I've got a polluted delta, but it, if you want, you can make this a uh, uh, scalding town or whatever. So, in terms of the mana base, uh, this isn't too different to like a pretty stock kind of miracles list. Um, it's probably a lot more planes than uh, miracles would normally use. Um, and then, currently with miracles, you would expect them to be to be playing Mystic Sanctuary as well. Um, so, yeah, while well, the mana base obviously not crazy. Um, there are some extra demands in terms of white sources that make the extra planes, and by extension, um, when you have this number of islands and so many planes, um, Mystic Sanctuary becomes a bit worse um, because you can't you know, use it as consistently. And then the other thing about this list that you'll see is um, there are just far less interesting um, instant and sorcery spells to be returning. So, uh, on to the spells. So, we have four ponder. Four brainstorm. Four source flashes. Um, and four force of world. So these are just like the good blue-white spells for Legacy. Basically every blue-white deck in Legacy will play these 16 cards. Um, whether that's uh, Miracles, or Stoneblade, or even Blue-White Delver. Um, you know, they pretty much will always be playing this core. Um, so I'm just trying to say that like obviously this isn't innovative yet. Um, haven't haven't shown you the spicy cards, but there is this like solid foundation of just like the good interactive consistency tools. Um, so yeah, at this stage you kind of don't even really know what kind of um, deck list it is. So next two cards, keep still keeping it a bit of a mystery. Um, two counterbalance. So. This kind of gives it away um, as some kind of more controlling list, probably um, miracles ish, um, as that would kind of be the only card that would really, be, oh, sorry, the only archetype that would really be interested in playing counterbalance. Um, so we'll add that to the pile as well, two counterbalance. Um, so now we have a little bit of a time for an aside. Um, I want to talk about the card Monastery Mentor. So that, that 
Mentor has been used as a win condition in Miracles before, um, and people have even played up to four copies main. Um, so you might say that playing a creature like Mentor has a little bit of consistency problems when you uh, include it in a deck with Terminus because you don't want to be sweeping your own creatures away. Um, but Mentor is a pretty strong card. It gives you a way to pressure opponent's planeswalkers. Um, it puts a clock on the board. You can kill the opponent pretty quickly and it also defends well. Um, you can chump block with the tokens or if you can cast enough spells in one turn. Um, threaten to make combat like really complicated for the opponent. Um, so all those things are pretty nice about Mentor, even in a Miracles deck that plays Sweepers. Um, the reason why Miracle, uh, Men sorry, why Mentor might not be such a good choice at the moment is because um, of Oko. So tapping out for Mentor and attempting to pressure Oko is not a great plan um, when the Mentor can just immediately get turned into an Elk. Um, and even worse, if the Oko has enough loyalty, they can down tick uh, for the Oko's quote unquote ultimate um, and just steal your mentor. So um, it's not really a good card in the fear mirrors right now. So, like, you, you want the ability to pressure planeswalkers because planeswalkers are so popular, everybody's got like Nasa and Teferi and so on. Um, and Oko, of course. Uh, but uh, Mentor itself is not the most exciting option, uh, just specifically because of Oko. Um, so, what other card could be like a kind of Mentor like uh, effect, right? So, in terms of pressuring Planeswalkers, the, the effect that some kind of controlling decks have used in the past is something like Lingering Souls. Um, 3 mana, you get 2 one, one spirits, 2 more mana, you get 2 more 1-1s. One, um, so in like a super grindy situation, that card can be okay. Um, like it has flashbacks, so it interacts well against counter spells. Um, you know, the tokens have flying, blah blah blah. But the tokens are so weak that they're not very good at pressuring planeswalkers. If you want to have only four power in play, then you have to spend five mana on it. Because um, they're one ones, they all die to Plague Engineer. So um, there's a lot of reasons why that card's not so great uh, in Legacy either. Um, so the card that I am playing, which I would argue is a kind of um, mentor slash lingering souls hybrid is History of Benalia. So Legacy players might be a bit unfamiliar with this card. Um, it hasn't seen any play in any format except Standard, where it was only used in like white weenie aggro decks. So how sagas work is, so it's a, this is a saga type enchantment card. Um, when this enters the battlefield, so the sagas enter the battlefield with one counter, um, and then you get the number one effect, um, then at the beginning of your main phase, not, not in the beginning of your upkeep, which as you'll see later is uh, quite important, you get another counter, and then you get the associated effect, and then when you reach the final stage, um, which for History of Benalia is the level 3, you get that final effect and then you sacrifice it. So the what History of Benalia does is the first and second effect you get a 2-2 Vigilance Knight token, um, and then the third effect is that it inspired charges all of your knights, um, so they get plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn. So, um, yeah, so like I say, the way I like to think about this card is a kind of um, mentor slash lingering souls hybrid. Um, the, the, the saga itself can't be elked. Um, and once it comes into play, it comes with one counter, um, and you immediately get one knight, then even if this gets decayed or they bolt your token or um, something, whatever, anything like that, you still have the 
other piece left over. So it's a bit more resilient to removal than something like uh, Monastery Mentor would be, whereas if you tap out for Mentor and it just dies instantly, then you do either Bolt or Decay, or if it gets out, you know, you just don't get anything out of it. Um, and then by itself, um, the history gives you four power for three mana, um, and then when the um, Inspired Charge effect goes off, they get plus two, plus one, so the, the turn after this comes into play, you attack for two, then the turn after that, you attack for eight, then you attack for four, so not only is this pretty good to pressure opponent's Planeswalkers, um, it also just clocks the opponent really fast. Um, So that's pretty good as well. Um, you might think that like this card's not really worth considering just because the ceiling isn't there. Um, so what I mean by that is like when you have a card like Monastery Mentor, the the sky's the limit in terms of the um, the amount of like tokens and power it can generate. Like in the late game, even without dividing top in the format, you can play a mentor and then like brainstorm and then ponder and then like plow their guy and then suddenly you have this like really ridiculous board of maybe like four or more monks um, whereas you know history of Benalia will never do that right it will only make two knights and then that's all um, which is kind of a valid criticism but the deck has a lot of other ways to synergize with um, this card and other enchantments so we're going to get into that now um, so in addition to our, so for our enchantment count so far, we have two history of Benalia and, uh, sorry, four history and two counterbalance. Um, the next option that I want to mention is Porphyry Nodes. Um, and Replenish. So, Porphyry Nodes is the white version of Drop of Honey. At the beginning of your upkeep, destroy the creature with the lowest power. Um, and then, when there are no creatures on the battlefield, you sacrifice Porphyry Nodes. So this kind of performs the role of Terminus. Um, in some ways it's worse than Terminus because it can't sweep um, in one shot. If your opponent has like three Reality Smashes and you top deck this, then you're still going to be dead. Um, whereas if it was a Terminus, you could sweep them all straight away. But on the other hand, if your opponent plays a Delver on turn 1, you can just straight away play this card if you want. It's like a Swords to Plowshares effect. You don't have to muck around trying to like brainstorm it back to the top of your library or anything like that. Um, so there are definitely pros and cons uh, to both. And then in this list we also have two copies of Replenish. So immediately you can, you can see there's some synergy already. Um, because if you need more removal, you can replenish four free nodes back. If you need, um, and it can also uh, create more threats because any of your sagas that have um, resolved all the effects will sacrifice themselves and go to the graveyard. So you can replenish them back and then uh, keep the supply of knights going. Um, and then even when you have a card like Counterbalance, which um, Obviously it doesn't put itself in the graveyard, unlike Porphyry Nodes and History of Benalia. Um, it just adds to the pressure of um, your opponent put, being put in a difficult spot. So if your opponent has like Thoughtseize or Abrupt Decay or Red Elemental Blast or whatever for your counterbalance, um, then it just makes your Replenish even stronger later. Because not only will it be returning your history and whatever, um, but you're also getting the advantage of bringing this back after your opponent wasted a card to kill it. Um, and then if your opponent doesn't interact with counterbalance, well then it will just take over the game, right? It's counterbalance. So yeah, replenish um, punishes any opponent who wants to try to interact with your enchantments, and then because your, your enchantments are so strong, which we're going to get into as we keep going. Um, if they don't interact with your enchantments, then you're probably just going to be overpowering your opponent with them anyway. So, 
add porphyry nodes to the list of enchantments. Um, the next, I will throw in um, some of the new Euros cards. So we have Omen of the Sea, four copies, um, and two copies of um, Metamise Prophecy. So Omen of the Sea, um, it's like an instant speed preordain. One mana enchantment flash when it enters the battlefield, scry to draw a card. Um, and then it ha also has the ability to pay two and a blue, sacrifice it to scry to. So um, it's just a nice consistency tool. It uh, helps to set up instant speed counterbalance stuff, both with the enter the battlefield effect and with the uh, sacrifice it to scry. Um, and then Metamise Prophecy is kind of like a predict. Uh, it's like a card advantage, cheap card advantage effect that takes a little bit of setup. So this is another saga, unlike History of Benalia, this one has four stages. So the first one, enter battlefield, just scry two. Next turn, um, name any card. The third turn, um, when you play the card that you named the turn before, you draw two cards. So it only triggers once, so you can't play like two ponders and draw four. Um, so yeah, you draw two, and then the fourth effect is just like a minor little bonus. You just look at the top card of uh, both players' library, which sounds kind of minor, but it does help you like plan your turn uh, pretty effectively. And of course, um, Metamise Prophecy is a saga, so it will sacrifice itself. Uh, and Omen of the Sea, you can pay mana to sacrifice it. So again, it has the replenish synergy. Um, yeah, so those those effects are pretty straightforward. Then getting more interesting, so we have um, one search for Ascanter. So a lot of Miracles decks nowadays are kind of avoiding this card because uh, it's pretty obvious as a wasteland magnet. Um, it just doesn't do too much until it flips, and then once it has flipped, uh, it pretty much just dies straight away, because you don't really have any other um, targets for Wasteland in your mana base. But um, because we do have the Replenish, it's just like a similar thing as when I mentioned with the um, Counterbalance. So if your opponent ignores this and lets it flip, um, then it's gonna take over the game because you get a free impulse every turn um, and then if your opponent does waste a resource to kill it that's just supercharging your eventual replenish uh, even harder so you know, it's, it's like another uh, kind of catch-22 for the opponent um, and also uh, when you're looking at your top card and you mill it to the graveyard then you can uh, get those, those cards back with the replenish as well so you have a little bit of extra synergy there um, I think it's a pretty strong effect as a one-off. Then we have one um, kind of spicy card, which is uh, the Mirari Conjecture. So this is the last saga in the deck. Um, uh, what this does is, again, it's the same saga mechanic. So when you, the first effect when it comes to play, you regrowth an instant. Um, the second effect is you regrowth a sorcery, um, and the final effect is bonus round. So that turn, um, you twin cast all of your instants and sorceries. So whenever you play an instant or sorcery, until the end of the turn, uh, copy it. So um, the first effect, you have Brainstorm, Source of Plowshares, and Force of Will, so that are all pretty useful in different situations. Uh, for the second effect, your only sorcery uh, is Ponder, and of course, Replenish. So the savvy uh, viewers will have already realized that, um, whoops, with Mirari's Conjecture, it is an enchantment, obviously, and it sacrifices itself when it's finished. So you can play Replenish, return this. When it gets the second effect, you can return the Replenish to your hand, 
then when the third when the third effect goes off, it sacrifices itself. You have the bonus round effect until the end of the turn. So when you play the replenish again, if they want to stop it from going off, they need a counter spell for the original and a counter spell for the copy. And then you can return the Mirari's conjecture and get your replenish back again. So you just have the loop um, that your opponent can can't really overcome um, with anything. Because you're even while you're doing this, you're returning like sword supply shares or force of will and stuff. Um, it just gives you like an ultimate um, grind loop, card advantage loop, lock your opponent out of the game loop. Um, and just on its own, often um, if you haven't found a replenish yet. Normally you can um, in the bonus round turn because if you play this on turn five, um, then maybe you return brainstorm. Then on the second time you return ponder. Um, you probably played like a sixth land by that point. Then on the 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 last turn you have the bonus round. So if you have like six mana, you get two brainstorms and two ponders uh, to try and find a replenish to like start the loop so even just as a card by itself it, it's a little bit expensive at five mana but that's why we're only playing one um, even even without this loop it's just a pretty uh, defensible solid card in its own right i think so yeah that's the Marari Conjecture. So we have two more cards, the last two spells in the main deck. Sorry, not the last two spells, because we have these three, which I haven't showed you yet. Um, is that one Detention Sphere and one Dove Insecurity? So uh, the Dove Insecurity doesn't really make sense until you see what these three cards are. The Detention Sphere um, is just a nice option. Uh, like a catch-all, like you know most miracles lists are still playing council's judgment so detention sphere kind of uh, does that job um, again it has the same idea that if your opponent counters it it kills it because it's an enchantment it's stacking up your, your replenish power um, and then because you have all these enchantment synergies main deck um, I'm also playing enlightened shooter in the sideboard so um, having the option to be able to tutor for a detention sphere um, can be good in some situations. So yeah, that's why I like that. That's why I have the one detention sphere. Then um, Dove Security is like a bit of a confusing one. So Dove Security, three mana enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, draw two cards. When you play an instant in your main phase, um, you can pick this up and return it to your hand again. So it's like a kind of mini card advantage engine, um, but you might think that this 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 for legacy is like way too slow. Even if you're like a replenish deck, surely there are better options than this. Um, but the fact that it has an into the battlefield trigger um, that draws a card and also gains two life is actually quite significant. Um, and the reason for that is we have these final three cards which really like lock the deck together in terms of all the synergies that are going on is three Estrid's Invocation. So this is a uh, commander card, not not from the most recent commander set, I think the year before. Um, so wh what this does is three mana, it's like copy enchantment. So, but it only can only copy enchantments you control. So three mana can enter the battlefield as a copy of any enchantment you control. But um, when you when you do copy an enchantment, it also gains the ability um, at the beginning of your upkeep. You may exile this and then return it to the battlefield. So um, it exiles, then it comes back, and you can copy another enchantment again, um, and you can keep doing that. So now. You know, while you might have previously thought, okay, we're playing all these enchantments just because they're good with replenish. Uh, let's go back through the whole list and, and examine 
all the different options this provides. So with the Dogen Security, every turn gain two life, draw a card. Um, if you want, you can also play an instant in your own main phase, so like the Brainstorm or the um, Plow. Then not only will you pick this up, but you'll also pick that up. Um, and then you can replay them all again and get even more card advantage. Um, but mostly for the life gain effect, and just to have one additional thing um, to copy with these for value, because um, just for consistency reasons, like even though these are very powerful, you do have to have something to, something to copy, otherwise they just don't do anything, so that's why I'm only playing three, and Dope Security is part of the ratio that makes that all work out. Um, but this could maybe be cut, and I'll get into that after I talk about the sideboard. Um, the Detention Sphere, you can um, copy it with Estrid's Invocation to exile more stuff. Uh, of course, if um, if you blink, if you then blink the Estrid's Invocation again, then whatever you exiled the first time will come back. But um, for example, but sometimes you just want to copy another thing. Uh, exile another thing and then leave it and stop blinking or if your opponent has threats that are like tokens then you can exile them all away with the blink um, and then blink and copy something else so some utility here um, omen of the sea uh, it's pretty obvious so fire exit arena not really a playable card in our uh, legacy sylvan library is like the only one of those effects that really sees any play in the um, kind of incremental card, uh, card advantage from Planeswalkers world that we live in um, but this combo is really good so instead of Phyrexia Arena where it does nothing when it enters the battlefield and then at the beginning of your upkeep you lose one life and then you just draw a card when you have this combo not only do, does it do something in your upkeep but you also get the effect straight away when it enters the battlefield you don't lose any life and you scry to uh, before every time you draw a card. Um, once this starts going for a couple of turns, normally your opponent's pretty dead. Um, the card advantage and the selection and everything is just too much. Um, then counterbalance. Um, not the most interesting thing to copy uh, in a vacuum um, because obviously Flipping your top card to counterbalance twice doesn't achieve anything, but you have the instant effects like Brainstorm and the Scry from Omen of the Sea. So um, if you can have a double counterbalance trigger, you flip one, see that their spell didn't get counted, then you manipulate the top card of your library to be something else, and then you resolve the second one, and then their spell will be counted. So that's an option you can do, and then. In some situations, if you have like a handful of counter spells, um, and you just really want to like make sure that Storm can't somehow win the game, um, then you can just copy it with Ezra's Invocation, and then you like your opponent needs two copies of Abrupt Decay to get out of it, for example. So that's something else you can do. Um, and then Porphyry Nodes. Uh, not the most interesting thing to copy, but if you're being swarmed by creatures and you need uh, some way to deal with them more quickly, um, then you can have two creatures be sacrificed every turn instead of one. Um, but the yeah, so like Azcat, <laughs> Azcanta is the only one we're copying. It doesn't do anything because it's legendary, obviously. So that's not going to be an example. But all of the sagas. Uh, or maybe Metamized Prophecy is not as good, but uh, the other two are definitely really strong. So, the way that the sagas work with Estrid's Invocation is um, because the sagas tick up at the start of your main phase, but Estrid's Invocation, the blink trigger goes on the stack at the beginning of your upkeep. So say you have... Um, a history of Benalia, and then you play. So, a sequence that you might imagine is okay, you play history of Benalia on turn three, that gets one counter, then you get uh, a knight. Then the next turn, you go to your main phase, this one goes up to two, you get another knight, 
then maybe you play your fourth land and then you play Eshrid's Invocation. You copy the history of Benalia. So that's got two counters. Uh, sorry, almost. Comes in, copy, and gets one counter. You get another knight. And then you can, if you want, you can attack for two with the knight that you played uh, the turn before. Then the next turn, this is when the interesting thing happens. You're in your upkeep, when this is still in play, um, the Estridge trigger will go on the stack. So you blink it, copy the history again, you get another knight, goes to one, and then now at the start of your main phase, this ticks up again. So you get another knight, then this will go up to three and go off. So you attack for two last turn. This is your turn five. Now these three can attack for 12, because they're all four fours. Then the next turn, on your turn six, you can either blink this copying something else to keep the value going, or you can just let this go up to three and then sack it. And if you do that, this will be an attack for 20. So you can really build like a big, powerful board state out of not a lot of resources, um, which is kind of like the monastery mentor power ceiling that I kind of referred to before. Um, and even if you have, um, the, um, history of Benalia is self-sacrificing, so, you know, it seems like you can't make an infinite stream of knights, because eventually this will die, and then if you want to blink this, it will have to copy something else. If you have two, um, Eshra's Invocations, you have to resolve the triggers one at a time. So if you have this, and then you copy it, copy it, and then you play another Estrus Invocation, also copying it, um, then when these are both History of Benalias, you can blink this one to copy this one, and then when this resolves, you blink it and copy that one. So you keep it, you can keep it going infinitely if you have to, and you get four knights every turn. So normally the game basically ends pretty soon if you do that. And uh, you can do the same trick with the Morari Conjecture, so copy that with the uh, Invocation, then go to your main phase and tick up, and then you can get an instant and a sorcery every turn. And then, yeah, Metamize Prophecy is a bit like the runt of the litter in that regard, right, because if the first effect, unlike nearly everything else that we've talked about, like the Omen of the Sea and the Sagas, the other Sagas, the, the first effect on this is only a Scry 2 which um, not the worst in the world but it's not card advantage so um, normally you want to be using it on something else but at least it's nice to have the option uh, before this metamized prophecy was printed I was playing um, a card called font of fortune here you go it's a uh, two mana enchantment and you can pay two to sacrifice it draw two cards um, I felt like you had to play this just to um, give the replenish just that little bit of extra push over the edge and just like a bit of card advantage to sort of fill that role as like a control deck. So uh, while Metamized Prophecy is still like one of the slower clunkier cards I think it's definitely a big upgrade to the Font of Fortune. Um, and then before before the um, Omen of the Sea was printed I was playing Spreading Seas because um, it's like the only two mana enchantment that draws a card on, into battle, on entering the battlefield um, in blue-white colors. So sometimes the like mana denial effect of making opponents lands and island is um, useful, but overall the scrying two before you draw a card and the self-sack effect on the Omen of the Sea are both insanely powerful. Um, and in most situations just way better than spreading seas so yeah so that's um, that's the whole list and even though it might look kind of weird um, I've been sort of trying to compare it to like miracles lists um, as I run as I've been running through it so if we just sort of um, organize the cards again. So 
screwed up the order as I've been trying to show you how it works. Um, So I just uh, sort this out again, just to sort of show you the uh, mana curve, which is a little bit more relevant because it's a counterbalance deck. So we have uh, four Brainstorm, four Ponder, four Swords to Flashes, um, and three Porphyry nodes, so that's 15 ones. Um, then we have two Counterbalance, two Metamized Prophecy, the Search for Ascanter, and the um, omen of the sea. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, two mana cards. I think we have nine three drops as well. We have four history banalia, three issued invocation. That's seven. The tension sphere and Dovin security. So that's nine. Then um, two fours and they were finish. What and then. 1, 5, and the 4 Force of Wills. The mana curves are uh, maybe a little bit heavy on the 3s, but a lot of Miracles decks are a bit like that now anyway with Oko and stuff, so I don't think it's too ridiculous in that sense. Um, and then just finally, just to like structurally show how you might interpret this as a kind of Miracles variant, even though superficially you would never think of it as like a Miracles deck, right? There's no Terminus, there's no Snapcasters, there's no Jace, there's no Planeswalkers. Um, you know, is it, how would you even conceptualize this as a Miracles deck? So, Miracles, so four Force of Will in your Miracles deck, one Entreat the Angels, two Jace the Mind Sculptor, three Snapcaster Mage, four Monastery Mentor, one Council's Judgment, um, two Counterbalance, two Predict. Four Portent, one as Canter because you're like a spicy Miracles player and you want to play as Canter. Um, three Terminus, four Swords of Flashes, four Ponder, and four Brainstorm. So, like, I didn't build the deck to follow that rubric, like I wasn't thinking like, oh, what card can I play that's roughly the same as Entreat the Angels? Um, it just sort of like turned out that way that like all these ratios worked out well. And I mean, that's what you'd kind of expect, right? Because Miracles um, is a deck that people have been playing for a very long time. And you would expect that, um, you know, over that time, it's been refined to like the sort of consistent machine that it is today. So it makes sense that like this list would function using similar ratios of cards that all perform in similar roles. Um, the one card that doesn't really have an analog in Miracles is the Dovin Security, <laughs> so we'll, we'll try and forget about that. But uh, yeah, every, you can sort of see how that all works out. Um, and then the sideboard. We have um, two Enlightened Tutor, so any white deck can potentially play Enlightened Tutor in their sideboard, um, and some of them do. Um, you know, in Stoneblade decks, they've sometimes played one or two Enlightened Tutor, or even a Death and Taxes, just to search for a variety of different um, sideboard bullets. But it's even more appealing in this list because you have um, so many other things you can do with it. Um, if you need card advantage you can get that as Canter um, or um, the Estrid's Invocation to get your engine going or if you want to like really lock the opponent out in the late game you can get your Morari Conjecture or if you need removal you can get the Detention Sphere. So it even has, even though you don't want to play it in the main deck because in a lot of fear matchups like there's no bullets to shoot for and you don't want the card disadvantage. Um, 
the fact that it, when you board it in, it does have synergy with cards that are already in your main deck, um, makes it a lot more of an appealing option. And then the the cards that you do search for with it, uh, like if your opponent kills them, you can replenish them back, or um, sometimes you can double up on them with Estrin's Invocation. So yeah, and Light and Shoot in the sideboard are a solid option, I think. So what are we going to be searching for with that? Um, we have quite a few options. So the first is um, two copies of Seal of Benzing. So of course, uh, Miracles if, will usually be playing some kind of disenchant spell, um, but we're not playing Snapcaster, so we don't have any synergy with instant sorceries necessarily. Um, you can tutor for Seal of Cleansing with the Light Intruder if you really need to. Um, you can, you know, you can cast this in response to your opponent playing a Chalice or something. Um, or if your opponent just has some other weird permanent that you really want to kill, um, tutor for it whenever you need. And then when you use it once, um, later in the game, when you play Replenish, come straight back. So uh, definitely a solid fit for the deck. You can see here one Pithy Needle. Um, not there for anything specific, it just generally helps in a few different matchups. Like you can name Dark Depths or Sneak Attack, uh, not Dark Depths, uh, Thespian Sage. Um, yeah, so that can help a bit, but Pithy Needle I wouldn't say is uh, essential. Um, but you definitely want to con always consider it in your sideboard map when you're planning for the different matchups. Um, I think it's good enough right now. Uh, you can even board it in against Fear Decks and name Planeswalkers because um, you don't have any, so you don't get punished by the symmetry. Um, obviously in Normal Miracles, if you bought it in Pithy Needle and named Jace, and then you drew your own Jace, you'd be a bit unhappy about it, but yeah, we don't have any of those problems, so Pithy Needle is pretty solid. Um, one Deafening Silence, like an anti-storm card. Um, even against combo decks that don't necessarily storm off, like Show and Tell, um, if you have the Deafening Silence down, then they can't protect their show and tell with either their own counter spells or like a um, Veil of Summer to play first because they can only play one spell per turn so um, the Deafening Silence is pretty good. Um, I've also tried playing the 4 mana Curse and tried to play I can only play one spell per turn um, and because that's not symmetrical it's like a pretty good tool in fair matchups as well like you put it in against Miracles and then it makes their counter spells really bad and then it also disables their snapcasters for example but uh, in the combo matchups I think having the one mana version of this is too important especially because the um, underworld breach deck is, seems to be gaining popularity now um, and remember that disenchant is also pretty good against underworld breach so we have a few more options there too but just versus storm and stuff I think the deafening silence is the one mana mode on it is uh, the biggest upside compared to all the other versions of this that you could be playing. Um, then we have one Grafdigger's Cage. So a lot of people, like, their brains are like very used to things that they've already seen in the past, right? So they see that it's like a blue-white control deck with a bunch of enchantments and a light intruder in the sideboard, and they think, oh, you must have rest in peace, right? Well, of course I don't, because it disables replenish and it disables Mirari conjecture, so I don't, I really don't want to be um, hating my own Gregor. So instead, we have Grafdigger's Cage, um, which doesn't stop either of those cards, um, and it still has mostly the same effect against like Reanimator and Storm and stuff. Um, obviously, not quite as effective as uh, Rest in Peace as a graveyard hate effect, but sometimes the fact that it costs one mana less is pretty relevant. Um, and it also can be useful against uh, other decks like Elves, for example, so it disables their, um, their uh, Green Sun Zenith and Natural Order and those kind of things. So yeah, so this is the Light and True Triple Grey Bad Hate option. Um, <clears throat> there are other like weird enchantments that you could play, like Ashes of the Abhorrent or Wheel of Sun and Moon or something, but they're just so ineffective um, as Graveyard Hate because the effect is quite narrow and you don't really gain that much about out of this effect being on an enchantment. Like if you copy it, it doesn't really do anything. Um, and if your opponent 
like kills it. Like if you're a dredge player, top decks there, nature's claim or whatever, you're probably going to instantly die anyway. So the fact that you can return it with replenish isn't super exciting either. So yeah, graf uh, grafting skate is perfectly fine. Then one back to basics. <coughs> uh, great versus any big mana deck. So like the twelve pose weird stuff. Um, even the smaller versions of Eldrazi uh, get pretty stomped by this card. Um, and then versus Delver as well. Um, it's just a random blowout, like 3 mana, win the game. If your opponent like let their guard down for a bit. Um, and again, just like with all the counterbalance and stuff, your opponent will probably find like a counter for this, or a Pyroblast, or something along those lines, but it's just making your Replenish uh, stronger and stronger. Then the last uh, Enlightened Shooter target, we have Humility. So again, like I was saying, the deck doesn't have a sweeper. Um, no terminus. So humility, having hu access to humility in certain matchups can be um, really important. So like elves, for example, or Eldrazi. Um, Yeah, just being able to turn every creature into a 1-1. One -one. And it's not an easy card for those decks to get rid of either once it's in play. Because like, it, it's not decayable because it costs 4 and it disables abilities of creatures like Reclamation Sage. Um, so yeah, that's a nice one. Uh, I was also playing one uh, Dawn of Hope in the sideboard. Um, which is just like a kind of backup win condition. So, if you've been following so far, you might notice that the only way the deck has of actually killing the opponent is with the knights from History of Banalia. Um, so, if those get surgical extracted, you actually have no way to win. So, uh, that's part of the reason why I wanted um, another win con in the sideboard, just so you can split them and have something else to do just in case your opponent. Uh, does figure that out and extracts your um, uh, history of banalias. But I'm not super impressed with this card. Um, it's just too. Even in the matchups where you want this kind of like grindy, slow card advantage effect, it's just too much mana to pay for and make a token. Um, with humility, it's kind of nice because you have an infinite supply of 1 1s that. Uh, equal to all the other creatures in play because everything's a 1-1 one, one. Um, so that's nice but I don't really like having this effect in the sideboard so what I think I would do is cut this from the sideboard open up another sideboard slot and replace the Dovin Security main deck with uh, Omen of the Sun so that's another card from the new Theros set uh, 2 and a white flash um, enchantment when it enters the battlefield you make 2 1-1 one, one human soldiers and you gain 2 life um, and you can pay um, two mana and a white and sacrifice it to scry two. So uh, that Omen of the Sun will have the same life gain effect um, as the Dovin Security, as like a Enlightened Shooter target if you're playing against Burn or something. Um, and then uh, it also has the same synergy as Dovin Security with uh, Estrogen Invocation, right? Because you can keep popping it to gain life and make tokens. Um, maybe. In general, you might like to draw cards a bit better, but, you know, I guess it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, and then it also makes tokens to attack, so it gives you the same option of having a, um, a win con with a different name, so you play around Surgical. So yeah, that's probably what I would tr uh, try to do uh, moving forward. I did also think about replacing all of the history of Benalias with Omens of the Sun as well. Um, it makes the mana base a bit more stable because you don't need double white to cast it. Um, and Flash and this extra Scry has a little bit of utility as well. But um, the the combat power of um, Omen of the Sun is just so much worse, like getting two 1-1s. One um, is really weak compared to getting two 2-2 two, two Vigilance Knights plus the Inspired Charge. Um, And then the other things to consider, like 
the omen of the sun tokens are 1-1s, one one, so like engineer sweeps them all the way. Um, yeah, overall I, I still think history of Benali is better, but it is quite close. Um, yeah, for now I would still play the 4 history of Benali, and then turn the Dovin security into an omen of the sun. Um, and then you don't have to play this card, so this card could be something else. Uh, and then the last few sideboard cards are uh, not enchantments. I just had two Dovin's Veto, um, two Force of Negation, and a uh, Surgical Extraction. So just some more generic um, anti combo stuff. You already have like the most. If you want anti creature stuff, like Humility is pretty much a go to. You don't really need uh, extra Path to Exiles or anything like that when you already have four Swords of Shears and four uh, or three. Um, Porphyry nodes in the main deck, so you just want some extra answers to like chalice stuff or combo, or um, even in the control mirrors, you can use the Dovin's Veto, they're pretty good. Um, and you can tweak the numbers on this as well. Like, if you think fast graveyard decks are going to be the thing, you can play more surgicals, or if you don't want to play two force of negations, you can cut one for a fluster storm. Or if you're afraid of red cards, one of these could be a hydro blast. That was a pretty popular decision around the Red and Six era as well. I probably wouldn't do that now, but it's just another option to be aware of. Um, yeah, you can mix and match amongst those kind of options. So yeah, I, I would definitely play the Humility, the Back to Basics, Cage, some kind of Rule of Law effect, um, two Disenchant, <laughs> and the two um, Enlightened Shooter. Those feel pretty... Um, essential and I'd probably if the Pithing Needle is good enough as well um, just being able to name Sneak Attack almost worth it just for that but also Stage you know it's, you're always going to find something to name with it um, and then yeah some kind of mix like this with maybe with some Fluster Storm or a Second Surgical instead um, and I'm pretty happy with that whole lineup so yeah um, at first, maybe it looks like a bit of a weird list, but um, in reality, it's not so different to a lot of decks that have already seen um, success and legacy before. And the the ceiling is just way higher. Like the ability to make card advantage, um, put threats on the board, grind. Um, is just like way higher than most other fair decks in Legacy, but you still have Force of Will, you still have Plow, you still have Counterbalance. Um, you, you're still interacting. The um, the only thing you really lose is like a real sweeper. Um, and in some matchups that does matter, but um, four free nodes does a really good imitation of a sweeper. Then you have the humility in the board, so. Yeah, I do think it's a very real deck, and I've tested it quite a bit. Even the previous version with the Spreading Seas um, had a lot going for it, but I just felt like uh, it was missing like a little something, like it was just a little bit under where I wanted it to be. Um, and then when the Theros leak came out, that guy who found like some packs in a shelf on a Walgreens or something where there was that the unofficial leak, and it had both of the new sagas in it, well no, sorry, the Minamaya's Prophecy and the Omen of the Sea. As soon as this, this leak came out, I was like, well, I'm not playing this deck at all until this was released, because it just makes the deck um, way stronger. Um, and it is, it is way better. And I think it's really good. So, um, if when I'm in Japan uh, in one week, if I decide that I'm not happy with Pioneer, and at the moment that's looking pretty likely. Um, you're going to see me at the side events um, jamming this list a bunch. Um, I After I just sort out those last few sideboard cards, um, and then I'll be good to go. So if you have any questions about the deck, any suggestions for those last few sideboard slots, or um, th thoughts about the strategy in general, then um, you can let me know in the comments. I appreciate any feedback. Um, or if you <laughs> uh, want to try it out yourself, then yeah, I encourage that. Um, 
so you can uh, try it out yourself and give your own feedback. I don't know if it works on Magic Online. Um, some early reports I saw said that Eastern Simulation caused a few weird bugs, which is not surprising because it's a pretty unique effect that does some strange stuff and like who knows what happens if you like copy a cycle with it. <laughs> Maybe it just doesn't work well at all. I mean some parts of Magic Online work well and some don't. So. Maybe, maybe that's what you could try if you're an online player. Um, just try, go in solo mode and just even see if it works. But yeah, don't expect too many people to be picking this up in, um, in paper or online for that matter. But uh, hopefully, if I get some winning records in uh, Japan, then people might start taking notice. So, yeah, that's the deck. Blue-White Sagas, Magic the Gathering, Legacy. Uh, this has been Life ITCG, signing off.